Hi there! Welcome to another episode. For today's video, we will talk about the foundation of language biologically. Have you ever asked yourself how humans are able to produce sound in language? Or have you ever wondered what is happening in our brain when we're thinking and processing information at the same time? It is more complex than what we thought it is. But in this video, we will make it simple on how language is being processed before we even say a word. Once again, welcome to the world of language. Language production and acquisition has complex process. Though, biologically speaking, it's undeniably the brain which functions first before the production and acquisition of the language. There are certain parts of the brain that are responsible in sound production and, of course, the acquisition. Let us first talk about the major parts of the brain that are responsible in language production. Let's begin with the theory of brain lateralization. Brain lateralization theory stress on the fact that the two halves of the brain, known as right and left hemispheres, function differently but yet interdependently. The left hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere is more analytical in nature and pays attention to details, handles assignments or processes information sequentially, and takes care of the tasks like writing, reading, and speaking. This hemisphere of the brain is also concerned with reasoning, rationality, logic, discipline, and rules and dealing with hard facts. People with strong left hemisphere have an inclination for science, maths, and technology. They also have a clear picture of their goals due to a clear sense of planning are physically quite active and extroverted in nature. The left hemisphere controls the right portion of the body. The right hemisphere of the brain. The right hemisphere deals with the softer facets of life. This hemisphere of the brain is concerned with emotions, feelings, intuitions, visualization, special knowledge, creativity, and recognizing patterns. Right hemisphere also helps in making inferences and provides a holistic perception, as a result of which the right hemisphere is helpful in developing a strong self-perception or sense of self-awareness. Right hemisphere controls the left side of the body, looks after the motor skills, sports and play, risk enduring capabilities, variety, flexibility, and people with strong right hemisphere are mostly introverts. Yet, talking about the language, it is the left hemisphere which is highly responsible to the production of language. As it explained, left hemisphere controls fine movements such as those required to produce speech, there are two areas in particular that appear to be especially important for language. An area toward the front of the brain in the frontal lobe that includes Broca's area and an area more or less beneath and behind the ear towards the back of the temporal lobe called Wernicke's area. These two regions form a language implementation wherein in Wernicke's area happen the analysis of word or comprehension and transferring into Broca's area for speech production. Classically, Broca's area has been associated with speech production and Wernicke's area with auditory comprehension of speech sounds. Wernicke's area, named after Carl Wernicke, is the region of the brain that is important for language development. It is located in the temporal lobe on the left side of the brain and is responsible for the comprehension of speech. 
While Broca's area, named after Paul Broca, is related to the production of speech, language development or a usage can be seriously impaired by damage to Wernicke's area of the brain. When this area of the brain is damaged, a disorder known as Wernicke's aphasia can result, with a person being able to speak in phrases that sound fluent yet lack meaning. Other than the two regions, the Broca and the Wernicke still have some important parts of the brain as shown in wernicke jasquin model. So here is the model. As you can see, we have number one, the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex controls the movement of the muscles. Number two, we have the Broca's area, wherein it involved in the production of speech sounds. Number three, we have the primary auditory cortex. This is the region of the brain that processes sound and thereby contributes to our ability to hear. Number four, the Wernicke's area. It involves in the understanding of speech. Number five, the angular gyrus. It assembles information to help us understand words and concepts. Number six, we have the primary visual cortex. Located in the posterior pole of the occipital cortex, the simplest, earliest cortical visual area, it is highly specialized for processing information about static and moving objects and is excellent in pattern recognition. Number seven, the arcuate fasciculus. It connects Wernicke's area to Broca's area. Let us watch this short video to help us understand how speech production happens at the very first place. Now let's trace the brain activity that occurs during a conversation. According to this model, when you are listening to someone talk, their voice is converted into signals that are sent to the primary auditory cortex and then conducted to Wernicke's area. This is where we can imagine that the words are actually comprehended, as this is where the neural representation of the thought underlying the reply is generated, which is then sent via the arcuate fasciculus over to Broca's area. From there, information is sent to the primary motor cortex, which controls the muscles in your mouth so that you may respond. Instead, when reading aloud, the visual information of the written words is sent to the primary visual cortex, and this information is transmitted to the angular gyrus, which translates the written word into the corresponding auditory signal and sends that to Wernicke's area for comprehension. The rest follows the same path already outlined. We should note that this is simply a model and is likely somewhat an oversimplification of brain function. After the brain processes the information, of course, it is time to deliver the words, information, by the vocal tract. The parts of the mouth involved in making speech sounds are called articulator. Three parts of the mouth cannot move, the upper teeth, the alveolar ridge, and a hard palate. These are therefore known as passive articulators. The other parts can move and are called active articulators. The tongue is a very important active articulator as it is often brought into contact with another part of the mouth in order to make a closure. The production of language seems very easy, but it is more complex than we thought it is from Wernicke's to Broca's area until we sound the word we want to say. So that is a short glimpse about the biological foundation of language, especially in sound production. We are done discussing about how language is being processed by the brain before even sounding it. Now, let's move to the biology of acquisition how we acquire the knowledge that we have and store it in our brain and retrieve it. Memory is one of the cognitive capacities by which we recall information and reconstruct
past experiences, usually bound for present purposes. Memory is one of the most important ways by which our histories are related to our current actions and experiences. Memory seems to be a source and resource of knowledge, according to Galloway 2009. We remember experiences and events which are not happening now. Therefore, memory differs from perception. We remember events which really happened if there was not a brain damage. So memory is not like mere imagination. Biologically, there is a long procedure taking place in our brain while an event is inscribed into the hemisphere. Moreover, we will be focusing on the biological process, how information being acquired and processed in our memory. Based on the interpretation of mental functioning, environmental information is excessively encoded, stored, and retrieved by a set of distinct mental structures. To simplify it, this is the model of how information is being processed in our brain. There are three mental structures in the model. We have number one, the sensory stores, the working memory, and the permanent memory. It starts from environmental stimuli. Those stimuli are being captured by our senses, the sound we heard, and other sensory events to which we are constantly exposed, especially the visual information or the iconic information and auditory information or the echoic information. So now let's take a look on the sensory stores. This involves our senses that take in the variety of colors, tones, tastes, and smells that we experience each day and retain them for a brief time in raw an analyzed form. It is assumed that we have one sensory store for each sensory system, but visual and auditory stores have been studied in any detail. The rest of the information that are not needed are lost. Number two, we have the working memory. This is also traditionally referred to as short-term memory. Although the meanings of the terms are similar, there is still a difference between them. Short-term storage means information are stored in a few seconds, but a working memory is a combination of storage and processing of information before it goes to long-term memory. During this period, only the important information is retained. In short-term memory, this information is called selective attention. This allows you to ignore other barriers like noise to select particular information needed and the unrehearsed information or unimportant ones are being eliminated or lost. Number three, permanent memory or long-term memory. Once information is stored in short-term memory, it goes to long-term memory through a process called encoding. Meanwhile, Long-term memory is brought into consciousness once needed through a process called retrieval. This includes general knowledge, such as the rules of grammar or arithmetic, along with personal experience such as memories of your childhood. Permanent memory holds all the information we have retained from the past that is not currently active but still in working memory. These memories are used to interpret new information and, in turn, the new events may later be added to this storehouse of information. Tulbing 1972 has distinguished between two types of permanent memory. Number one, we have the semantic memory and episodic memory. Semantic memory refers to our organized knowledge of words, concepts, symbols, and object. It includes such broad classes of information as motor skills, typing, swimming, bicycling. General knowledge like grammar and arithmetic 
special knowledge, the typical layout of a house, and social skills, how to begin and end conversations, rules for self-disclosure. On the other hand, episodic memory holds traces of events that are specific in time and place. This is the memory that we use to keep a record of our personal experiences. It thus varies from person to person and time to time. But remember that it is constantly updated, whereas semantic memory is relatively stable. Episodic memory includes such items as what you had for breakfast this morning, what you were doing when you learned on the September 11th tragedy, and where you got your first job. So this is the short biological explanation of language acquisition, yet in terms of acquisition, it is a broader concept which we can ex explore more on the next discussion about processes of acquisition. In summary, in production of language, we have Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And in terms of language acquisition biologically, we have these three mental processes, the sensory store, working memory, and permanent memory. If you have some questions in mind, anything you just learned, or ideas to share, you can write it down on the comment section below. Thank you and happy learning, everyone.